Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Panal, your uh, host for the uh, webinar. Uh, I have uh, both the panelists, Mana and Ratnakar, with us. It's a very exciting uh, agenda and very exciting session which we have. Uh, so, uh, so this session is brought to you uh, in collaboration with Apex, Apex Academy. Uh, Apex is a uh, academy started which focuses on big data and analytics and uh, is uh, part of Tech Mahindra Institute. So, so we have a very exciting agenda. In, uh, Manav actually leads Apex Academy and uh, has, uh, is CEO of Apex Academy. Before uh, starting Apex Academy, he uh, he uh, passed out of ISB and then he was running his own venture in uh, GMAT. So so uh, brings in a lot of experience with him. And along with him, we have Ratnakar, uh, who is right now leading analytics and data science for uh, Cabbage. Cabbage is a, uh, for those of you who don't know, Cabbage is doing some really exciting work on uh, uh, fintech side and credit lending side. So I'll, I'll uh, not go in more details. Uh, uh, Ratnagar will cover those details. So uh, so let's start. Uh, a quick announcement before we start. So uh, uh, in a week's time from today, we are doing DataCon in Hyderabad. So this is kind of launch of uh, uh, analytics with the chapter in Hyderabad uh, along with Apex. So, so we are doing this at Tech Mahindra campus. Uh, again, a very exciting agenda for uh, that day as well. So we are covering sessions like how to build a self-driving car in 20 minutes to uh, some industry experts coming and doing live demo uh, on uh, various uh, machine learning platforms. So if you are in or around Hyderabad, make sure that you register for DataCon and then be present on that day. Uh, uh, so, so uh, you can find more details on analytics with their website and as well as on uh, Apex Academy website. So, uh, so if you are around, make sure that you uh, uh, attend uh, uh, the DataCon, which is happening on 13th of uh, May. Right. With that, uh, as I said, so uh, we have Mano. Uh, uh, who you should be able to view in your screen. So Manav is founder and CEO of Apex Academy. Uh, they, they have some uh, interesting variety of courses on both big data as well as data science side. Uh, we have worked with Apex now for some time and then we have seen uh, people coming out of uh, their programs and, uh, and uh, gaining exposure to analytics and data science. Along uh, uh, with Manav, we have Ratnakar who heads uh, uh, analytics and data science at Cabbage. So, so with that, uh, Manav and uh, Ratnagar, welcome. Uh, and then Manav, over to you to uh, kind of take this session forward. Yeah. Thanks, Kunal, uh, for the introduction. I'm very, very excited to be here. Uh, this is one of the session in the machine learning week that we are doing. Uh, Kunal, if we can do a quick poll uh, and get a sense of how many people are joining from Analytics Vidya and how many people are joining from uh, Apex Network, uh, that will help. So can sure. you do that poll? Let me, so in fact, uh, let me launch a poll. There are a couple of questions on profile of people, so, if you, uh, so it will help us understand uh, the profile and then uh, a question on where did people hear about this webinar. So I'll just launch that Absolutely. poll so people should be able to see that on their screen. Uh, and uh, so audience, if you can take a minute and uh, do the poll, it would uh, help us understand and then kind of uh, do the session right now. <laughs> So guys, just go ahead and uh, fill up this poll. It will help us understand what is the audience profile today like. We uh, we still have people joining in. We already have 163 people who are here. And I think we should definitely cross uh, 300. So we want to get a sense of who all are joining. We'll just wait for uh, another 10 seconds to kind of do people can make a couple of minutes. Okay, so I'll uh, close the session. This should give us uh, a good idea. About 80% of audiences uh, voted. Uh, so I'll just share the results with uh, the panelists. 
and with the audience as well so so we have uh, most of the student are people who are students and have less experience in data science uh, about 20% people who have data uh, who are from data science background and are data science professionals and the work experience side uh, close to seven actually almost 80% of audience is less than 3 years of experience uh, and then uh, about 24% with more than 3 years of experience uh, and about an even split uh, in terms of uh, people joining from analytics and analytics. Right, uh, so Mano, over to you. Uh, I'll just close the uh, poll. Sure. Uh, how, if you can help me navigate uh, on the slide, um, that will be good. Uh, we want to move to the next slide. I've actually given you the controls, so you can now uh, control All the right. slides. I think, uh, just give me a moment. Yeah, so it, it's there's a big a bit of lag in uh, changing the slide, but I think uh, we are good. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, how many of us have already attended some of the sessions that we have been doing in the machine learning week? I just quickly want to get a sense that we have been doing some of these very exciting uh, sessions covering different areas. And since today we are talking about uh, FinTech, um, we all we did a uh, exciting session on stock prediction using uh, machine learning yesterday. Uh, so I want to get a sense of how many of us attended this session yesterday, or some of the sessions. Great. So I see that uh, some people have attended all sessions. Some people have attended three, four, five. Uh, all right. Great. So. First session. So those of you who are coming from analytics with, with there, I think for them, this will be the first session. And those of you who have been coming from, from Apex Academy, uh, I think uh, this would be uh, one of the sessions. This, this is what would be one of the many sessions that you would have been attending. Right? So, uh, so today is the second last session in machine learning week. Uh, today we have a very, inter very uh, interesting uh, panelist who's going to speaker, who's going to talk, uh, a lot about careers and especially we are going to set the context in a different way we are not going to take the usual approach of just talking about careers but what we are going to do is we are going to help uh, Ratnakar is going to help us understand where this world is moving and how does it relate uh, uh, to it so the last session that we are doing in this is tomorrow at uh, 12 uh, we have a data scientist uh, from uh, Deloitte joining us, Orko Bhattacharya joining us from Chicago. He is going to talk about how he transitioned from metallurgy uh, background as undergrad to data science uh, and machine learning as a field. All right. So a uh, quick introduction about Ratnakar. Um, uh, Ratnakar heads India. He is the India head of analytics and data science for Cabbage. Cabbage is a fintech company. And um, uh, the interesting thing is that both of us have graduated from the same school, uh, uh, that is uh, Indian School of Business. He graduated much, much, much more, uh, uh, much, much before me, uh, but we belong to the same fraternity. I'll also leave, uh, he is also a very frequent uh, um, poster on uh, Quora. So he, he writes quite, quite, a, quite very interesting answers on uh, Quora, so you must follow him. Uh, at the end, I'll ask uh, him to leave his Quora profile details, and uh, I'm sure that uh, a lot of you would be interested in following him on uh, Quora. So uh, over to you, Ratnakar. If uh, you can tell us more about you, you what, your, what your journey has been, and how did you land up in this uh, field, uh, especially because now big data, data science, machine learning, all of this, we already know that this is where the future is. But way back when we got into this field, and possibly when we had not even heard about this, uh, it, was, it would have been a little atypical kind of uh, decision. So how did that yeah. journey uh, materialize? And how did, you know, what were the uh, building blocks or stepping stones on that journey? Because it's been quite an interesting uh, uh, journey, I guess, for you. Yep, yep. Thank you, Manav. Um, just a quick check. Can you uh, all hear me OK? Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So, uh, guys, I mean, just a little bit about myself. Um, can I get the control, Mano? Yeah, so um, I think Kunal have, will be able to give you the control. Uh, 
have you got it? Ratnakar, you should have the control yeah. now. Yeah. 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 Okay. Perfect. Good. Thank you. So, welcome everyone. Let me just uh, go to the right slide over here. Okay, so a little bit about uh, myself. So I have about 15 plus years of experience in the fields of analytics and data science. And some people uh, use this term interchangeably. Right? So I mean, I'll uh, probably you know provide some color as we go on. You know, what could be the difference between the analytics and data science? So currently, I'm heading the India practice for the company called Cabbage. Most of you would not have heard about this company, and I uh, will talk about this company a little bit, right? Prior to that, I was heading a startup over here in Bangalore, where I actually set up the entire analytics and machine learning practice for them. Before that, uh, you know, I worked almost for six years, you know, close to five and a half, six years with uh, Citigroup in the global decision management, um, where I was uh, leading the entire uh, analytics practice for a couple of geographies there, right? So, uh, you know, in terms of my career, guys, I mean, I have started my career way back in 2000 in the fields of analytics and data science when in fact nobody would recognize you know what is analytics and what is data science so i actually graduated from hbti kanpur then i worked briefly for tata motors and after that i went to us to really um, get my master's degree and during the master's degree i developed the passion for data and everything to do with the data analysis right so after that, I took a job, uh, took a job in a company called Texas Instruments, which is basically an engineering company, and where I was working throughout my career in the fields of analytics and data science. Right. So just a little bit about Cabbage, uh, the present company that I've been part of. Uh, this is a fintech company, and we will talk about what is a fintech. Uh, we issue loan to the small medium enterprises uh, uh, in US. I mean, there are some operations that we have in the other countries like. Canada and Mexico and you know Europe, but mostly in the US. Cabbage also facilitates uh, the software and the platform for the other companies or the other banks like ING and Scotia and so on and so forth. Right? We have been rated as one of the top company uh, in the US on multiple different dimensions. Uh, one of the most preferred employer in the Glassdoor, 36th uh, fastest growing company in the US, and you know one of the most innovative companies as well. We issued about $1.2 billion worth of loan in 2016, and we are on track to really double that amount this year, right? So what really is Cabbage? Cabbage, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, is fintech company, but uh, instead of calling ourselves a, as a fintech company, what we prefer to be calling ourselves is a data company. Everything that we do is basically based on the data. So data is the core competency that we are leveraging to do all the decisioning. And we'll be talking about some of those areas as we move forward, right? Okay. Right. Um, so, yeah, so yeah. Uh, two things we would want to understand, first of all, is that uh, this space that you guys operate in, uh, because we are going to talk about careers, but it will be good if we can have some more insights into the space, what, what, what exactly fintech means, uh, yeah. and then we would want to talk about where uh, where the careers are and what are the trends. So, uh, sure. if you can if you can talk about that, uh, it'll help. Okay, great, great. Yeah, thank you, Manav. So, if you look at the uh, fintech, fintech is and let me see if I can draw something on my screen. So, fintech is nothing but a combination of finance, right, and technology. So when you combine the finance with the technology, the intersection of that is what we call as fintech, right? And the key difference. Just a minute. In, just a minute uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, Ratnakar. I think you we are not able to see what you're drawing. Uh, for that, oh, Kunal yeah. will have to make you a presenter totally. So Kunal, okay. uh, that is better if you can uh, make. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, you can share your screen directly, uh, uh, and then okay. take over. Let, yes. let me let me that yeah. Share, share screen option, Ratnakar. You'll just have to click on that, uh, and yes. we'll be able to see your screen. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. Yeah. Okay. So, I guess I mean you can see my desktop now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Okay. Perfect. So sorry about that. I didn't realize that you cannot see it. So I was uh, just uh, drawing something on the screen and most likely you'll be able to see it now. So if you look at the FinTech, 
fintech is a combination of fin which is basically short for finance and tech which is the short for technology the intersection of the finance and technology is what we have as a fintech industry right the key differentiator uh, between a fintech company uh, and a regular company is that we leverage technology very very heavily and most of the technology is nothing but basically the data that we have right now if you look at the uh, spectrum of the fintech companies it's basically on the screen so alternate lending right so uh, even though some people do not like this term alternate lending is that i mean instead of going to a bank you actually approach companies like lending club in the us prosper in the us zopa in the uk cabbage in the us and you actually borrow from them right uh, so this is one type of fintech companies that we are talking about the other one obviously we all should be familiar with which is something like paytm right so it basically facilitates the payment and the billing there are a bunch of other companies so and financials for those of you who don't know is the biggest uh, payment processing company based out of uh, china right so this is the ant group um, and uh, you look at the other one which uh, uh, something like credit karma or bank rate or nerd wallet they are the personal finance and the assets management companies right so basically they will advise you in terms of you know where you should be investing your money what sort of return you can expect what is the right time to enter in the market and so on and so forth so basically your personal advisor for your financial needs right robo advisor is you know something which is very very upcoming and uh, we have bunch of names there as well and what it really it means is that you actually log into a system let's say you are actually logging into wells fargo bank system and you open up a chat window uh, instead of you know actually being a personal financier over there it's a robot who is talking to you so the robot will ask you you know how old are you or what exactly are you planning to do in your career and what are your investment goals and so on and so forth and based on the questions that step by step and give you the solution that you really require so what it really does in the process is that it minimizes the human interaction and it creates a consistency from customer to customer so that i mean um, you know one customer cannot really say that somebody who was sitting on the other side was not nice to me or did not give me the correct advice and so on and so forth right and the last one which is getting very very popular and there is no fintech discussion which is complete until you mention the blockchain it's basically nothing but you know uh, a sort of chain connected to each other and the, the you know if you are borrowing a loan or if you are you know paying somebody that basically percolates up and down the chain and uh, more supports you have more votes you have i mean the higher the confidence that you are telling the truth right so that's what it is in terms of the numbers guys fintech i mean you can see the numbers i'm not going to cover all of them in interest of time but 24.7 billion dollars invested in the fintech companies in 2016 there are you know around 20 plus unicorns for those of you who don't know unicorns those are the companies which are valued more than a billion dollar and cabbage is one of them right and uh, roughly 50% of the consumer worldwide have done some business with the fintech right so whether it's for the payment or for the personal finance or for the lending or whatever it might be they have some touch point with the fintech company so that's about the fintech model uh yeah so now um, we have a good sense of what the fintech space and the different things in fintech uh, are all about help us understand that uh, you know uh, the interesting thing about analytics and machine learning uh, especially yeah. these uh, areas is that uh two industries have been using analytics for a long time in fact uh, yeah. since the 1980s or 70s insurance industry was the first to adopt statistics because statistics statistics was a very very big part of insurance and over a period of time because of the very sensitive nature of the financial services industry um financial services industry adopted analytics and then uh, internet companies came into picture companies like google yeah. yahoo and all of these started getting into machine learning and then fintech adopted machine learning so tell us uh, a little bit about you know what the transition has been uh, like yeah. and what is the future of machine learning machine learning as an area is also like when we talk about something like say robo advisory uh, wealthfront mm -hmm. is the biggest name in the space we also have some robo advisory companies uh, getting started in india so mm -hmm. it's like a machine learning ai combination so tell us a little bit about what the background has been um, possibly in context yeah. of your industry 
and yep. where do you see the future not only in terms of your industry but in terms of uh, uh, where machine learning and ai is headed towards say in the next absolutely. 5 to 10 years absolutely absolutely so i'll give you a little bit of a background right so when um, you know i started my career most of the uh, and i actually can draw something i mean i think i mean that will give you some perspective right so if i have to break it down i mean i will say you know the bottom of the pyramid is what we call as descriptive analytics right and i will explain you know what exactly these terms are then we have diagnostic analysis then the third one is predictive analytics and the fourth one is prescriptive analytics right so when most of us we start our career or when i started my career i was actually doing what we call as the descriptive analytics right and what really it means uh, from the descriptive analytics right uh, does anybody from audience has any idea in terms of what the descriptive analytics may signify any guess is a good guess i mean you could be you know away from the right answer but as long as you have a guess let's hear from you describing data okay historical data analysis finding yes absolutely thank you so descriptive analytics folks is actually nothing but telling what has happened right so let's say if i'm working in a portfolio let's say i'm working for a bank and the manager of the business unit would like to really see how many customers we have booked what sort of uh, aum we are managing what sort of uh, you know interest rate we are charging the customers what sort of losses we are looking at all of those are answering the question of what so basically whenever you are answering the question of what that is nothing but the descriptive analytics so i will just move back to the slide over here so that you can see it better yeah so this is answering the what question right diagnostic is something similar to descriptive which is basically you know trying to understand why it has happened so let's say you say the portfolios uh, you know revenues have gone down so you are actually trying to figure out why it has gone down so it's more like the diagnosis that a doctor might be doing so you go to a doctor and you say i have fever then you say i have fever fever is the symptom which is the descriptive part right diagnostic is the doctor will figure out you have a fever because you may have malaria or you may have dengue or you may be suffering from some other viral infection right so that's the diagnostic the third one in the uh, in the hierarchy of the scheme of things is predictive analytics where you know what has happened historically and looking at the historical information now you are making prediction about the future you're trying to suggest you know what is going to happen in the future that's the predictive analytics part and last but not least which is the uh, the most important portion right now is the prescriptive analytics and this is very similar to you know what you can imagine as a consulting opportunity so you are actually consulting with your clients and you're telling what should be the right prescription for them so imagine that you um, you know went to the doctor doctor gave you the prescription that you are suffering from this disease and you have to be taking this prescription for a certain amount of time to really recover from that right the only difference in terms of the business application is that there is no disease but you have a business objective your business objective could be that i have to gain a market share of 30% or your business objective could be i have to increase my sales by 10% the prescriptive analytics is going to tell you how you can do it right so now going back to the question that mano was asking so where are we heading we are heading more from the diagnostic and the uh, you know descriptive analytics to more predictive and prescriptive analytics right so you have to predict the future and you have to prescribe the right solution and that's where the machine learning and deep learning really come in right so i will spend some time talking about the ml and ai do you think i mean uh, i mean anybody has any sense of you know what is a machine learning what is uh, artificial intelligence in a very very simple laymanish english let's hear from the group very quickly we would not be able to spend a lot of time but uh, whatever you guys know okay all right perfect thanks for your comments that's great so we have 292 in audience now uh, and that's great so i will not be able to read all the comments but i'm getting a general gist of what the audience thinks that's great okay so folks the machine learning and ai is nothing but you can imagine that the moment we get into the territory where typically a human mind would be doing a better job where there is a cognitive intelligence right uh like your mind really functions right that's where we actually have the machine learning and ai coming in right 
and a lot of that is being driven by uh, you know factors that I'll be talking about very briefly. But anytime you think, I mean, that you have to mimic the human thought process, right? And I will give you one example. So, for example, when you go to Amazon, you buy one product, and after you buy that product, or even when you buy the product, uh, you will see some recommendation that people who bought this also bought this, or customer who viewed this also viewed this, right? So they are actually replicating what would have been a typical sales pattern if you had visited in a store, the, the sales clerk or the salesperson over there would say, sir, I mean, you have taken a phone, why don't you buy an iPhone cover as well, right? So same thing you're actually trying to replicate, but by doing uh, what we call as the machine learning and AI, right? So that's the biggest difference where you are combining the uh, power of man and machine to really make the right decision in the right time for the right customer, right? Now, I have a particular way of explaining the AI. I mean, AI stands for artificial intelligence, but in my opinion, it is more like the augmented intelligence. And that's the question, you know, Manla was also uh, alluding towards, right? When I mean augmented intelligence, it doesn't mean that machines will take over everything that the humans are doing right now and there will be no need for the data analytics professional down the road. It just means that you will be combining your human intelligence with the machines to really come out with the faster and more appropriate decisions, right? So that's where, that's where we are heading. Now, why we are doing that? Why there is so much craze about the machine learning and deep learning? So there are several contributing factors. First one is the big data. Who can tell me what is a big data? I guess, I mean, you have been, some of you have been part of the session. So what are the key constituents of the big data? Okay, perfect. So everybody got it. Most of you got it correctly, right? So this is basically the three V's or the four V's, but three V's are the most important, which is the volume, velocity, and variety, right? So we are actually getting a lot of data right now at a very, very fast speed and in a variety of different formats. So that is one contributing reason for the growth of the machine learning and uh, deep learning, right? Um, you know, there's in statistics by IBM that 90% of the data that we have today with us has been generated in last two years only, right? And this is following a law called Moore's Law. And uh, the Moore's Law is nothing but basically, uh, it was, you know, something that was developed for the electronics industry, it says every two years, the computing power will double, right? So the same thing is gonna happen with the data that every two years, the amount of data that we have is gonna double, right? So that's why you need to have, you know, more sophisticated, more automated systems to really deal with this information. So that's the first contributing factor. The second contributing factor, in my opinion, is the faster computation. So in older days, I mean, the memory would be very, very, big and will not be able to do that much. Now we have, you know, significant faster processors and they can do much more faster processing as well. So the faster computation is, you know, another contributing factor for the growth of the machine learning and AI, right? The third one is cheap storage. Now everybody is walking around with, you know, 256 GB of phone or, you know, SIM card, I mean, SD cards and so on and so forth, right? Earlier, I mean, that was impossible, right, to have that sort of memory. So the memory is becoming very cheap. The form factor is getting very, very smaller. And those are the contributing reasons as well. The fourth factor, in my opinion, is basically the real-time decisioning. As I mentioned earlier, that you would like to talk to the customer in real time. And you would also like to customize uh, the solution for the customers, right? So in marketing, we say that the ideal segment size is a segment size of one because each one of us is unique. Kunal is unique, Manav is unique, I'm unique, you are unique, right? So it, it's not necessary that whatever Manav likes, I will also like the same thing. So how can we really customize the product and services that we are delivering to the customers in a real time basis? And that's where you see that machine learning and uh, deep learning will be coming in very, very handy as well. And the final factor folks, in my opinion, is nothing but uh, the multimodality. Right, and I will explain this term. Uh, this basically means that the data that you are getting is multimodal, right? So it's coming in from variety of different uh, sources. So you're getting data from the social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, so on and so forth. You are getting data from the chat boards like WhatsApp, right, and HipChat, and you know Instagrams, and so on and so forth. You have the videos, you have the audios, you have the text file, you have the transaction data. You have the, you know, the data from the government sources. You have the publicly available information. 
you have the web data browsing history so you can clearly see that i mean the amount of data that you're getting is mind boggling and it's not the same format so i mean the format is not necessarily something that is going to fit in your excel file and that is what is fueling the growth of the ml and ai right so manav i will rest here hopefully that answer the question on where we are heading no amazing insights i think uh, those are very good uh, starting points to understand that why this phenomenon is happening we are saying that this is happening but why this is uh, happening uh, those are very good insight now uh, my next question is re related to deep learning in the entire machine learning week that we did uh, right from ebay uh, to e machine learning at scale in ebay uh, to yeah. computer to a lot of the sessions that we did all the speakers said that uh, they their companies are proactively getting into deep learning right everybody mm -hmm. said that you know deep learning is where things are because because of the inherent nature that you don't have to do a lot of feature engineering the the, the system in itself learns and all so right. do you think that it is limited this phenomenon is limited to internet companies like google facebook amazon who which are sitting on huge 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 amount of data number one and number two is the very characteristic of deep learning is that you need millions and millions of data points to actually feed into the system right yeah. so that's the reason that these companies can do build a deep learning network or something called neural network and all but yeah. is this learning phenomenon also going to uh, is being is it being adopted in other industries where possibly yeah. you do not have the uh, scale of data uh, or i may be yeah. wrong a lot of these you know banks have that scale of data it, it may yeah. not be in the form that internet companies have so is yeah. this uh, is the deep learning phenomenon taking over the uh, uh, taking over other industries and particularly in your your industry as well uh, yeah. Uh, yeah if you can throw some insights on that definitely definitely so i think i mean uh, thanks for that uh, point so i'll just ask you guys i mean uh, have you guys seen any machine learning deep learning um, you know application in your day to day life so you can take a minute to think about it and let me know if you've seen any of these applications in and around you let's hear the or let's look at the comment yeah so google algorithm facebook tagging recommendation system okay great wow perfect right so great so i mean i think a lot of you guys have seen something right so i'll give you some quick examples and that addresses the question that manav was asking earlier the long and short answer of that is that there is no industry there is no vertical and there is no function where the deep learning is not either existing right now or will exist in a short time right so that is the power of deep learning and machine learning that we're talking about right and i'll give you some examples in and around us right so uh, some of you would have iphone and you talk to siri so siri what is the temperature outside right so siri is nothing but a you know underlying machine learning algorithm similarly the google assistant that you have right or for those of you who are using the microsoft uh, windows i mean cortana is there right all of these are nothing but you know underlying machine learning and deep learning uh, algorithm in us uh, amazon echo is very very popular and people use it as a personal assistant so i mean actually you know somebody uh, mentioned in one of my talks that I, that, I, that i attended that they enjoy talking to echo more than talking to a live human being so so you can imagine how much you know deep learning has changed our life in terms of the penetration right the other applications as some of you mentioned clearly i mean when you go in google search right and you say that i'm searching for something the moment you put something um, in the search window it will automatically start popping up the suggestions for you right and it's very very uh, you know sort of like you know fine tune to the context fine tune to your previous search history uh, your location the ongoing activities around you and so on and so forth right so i have put you know some articles on quora on this right so when uh, i forgot i mean it was a test series with i think either england or australia and you know i think uh, ashwin in, ashwin uh, basically took some wickets and he was an instrumental uh, player in causing that victory for india so the moment you put letter a even without knowing anything else it will just say suggestion in terms of suggestion it was saying ashwin right why why was it saying that right or is it going to do it all the time the answer is it was very very context driven thing right so at that time the context was that the the test match was happening and a lot of people were searching for you know something similar so the moment you put a 
Google was able to figure out that more likely than not, I mean, you are looking for Ashwin as well, and they were able to pop it up for you, right? Um, there are a lot of other examples as well. So I was in uh, recently when I went to Singapore to present my paper in one of the conferences in deep learning, and we are looking at some of the snippets from there. We actually went to the Universal Studio as well. And in Universal Studio, I don't know how many of you have seen a movie called Shrek. So in Shrek movie, there's a character donkey, right? And uh, there was a show where, you know, anybody from the audience will get up and uh, will talk to donkey. So the donkey will say, hey, what's your name? And you'll say, my name is Mano, for example. Donkey will say, hey, Mano, nice to meet you. Where are you from? Mano will say, I'm from India. And the donkey will start having a conversation. And not just a conversation, but very, very funny conversation, depending on the context, depending on the age of the you know person uh, who donkey is talking to. So all of this is you know being driven by the machine learning and deep learning, right? So the uh, long story short, I mean, I think you know whether you are in the retail, whether you are in the financial sector, whether you are in the technology, whether you're in the healthcare, everywhere you will see this getting penetrated more and more. And some of the sectors like fintech, I mean, there's no way you can be an efficient data scientist unless you know machine learning and deep learning, right? So I will pause there, Mano. Yeah, sure. Uh, so before we move to move on to the next slide, uh, if you can quickly differentiate between machine learning and deep learning, so some other yeah. people might be a little confused between the two terms. Very, very quickly, if you can sure. just set the point, what, what the two, what the difference between the two things is, uh, that will help people understand when you uh, take the fintech example and the case study, the research work. Yep, yep. So very, very simply speaking, I mean, this is a very, very coarse definition and obviously uh, there are much more to it, but I will uh, separate out what it is, right? So machine learning is basically nothing but, you know, whatever underlying algorithm that we use, whether it's a logistic regression model, and don't be worried if you don't understand these terms. I mean, you will understand as you move forward in your journey, right? So whether it's a logistic regression model or whether it's a support vector machine, or whether it's a chain and card decision tree and so on and so forth, right? So when you're using the packages like scikit-learn in Python, or you're using H2O uh, in R and stuff like that, that's what basically constitutes a machine learning algorithm, right? So it's basically you have uh, you know, trained the models on the historical data, but your underlying techniques could be any of the classification algorithms, any of the regression algorithms, so you could be using a linear regression, you could be using a logistic regression, you could be using a naive base or support vector or chain or card or whatever you might be using, right? So that's what basically the machine learning part is, which is a little bit higher than a typical modeling development activity because a typical modeling uh, development activity is mostly driven by uh, uh, a human, right? So 80% of the job will be done by the human in terms of the data cleaning, preparing the data and all that in a typical predictive modeling exercise. In machine learning, that goes down significantly. Now let's switch gears and talk about the deep learning. Deep learning is basically what uh, the underlying engine of a deep learning is nothing but what we call as a neural network, right? And uh, the neural network, uh, for I mean keeping it very simple is basically nothing but a close replica of how our uh, brain really works right so we have neurons in our brain and they communicate the signals and it's very very complex way of working right so the deep learning networks are nothing but the neural networks the reason why they are called deep is because they are very very complex and they are very very non-linear right so most of the machine learning algorithms will be linear so for example uh, i'll just give you uh, a differentiator so for example if i have drawn a parameter so and if i'm looking at the default versus the non-default non-default will be zero over here and default will be one over here right so machine learning algorithm will really come out with a linear separator where you know customers who are defaulting on their loan will be on one side and the customers who are non-defaulting will be sorry i'm saying the other way so customers On the other hand, the deep learning application is much more when you know you may have things like this. So I have zeros and then I have one, then I have one and then I have zeros, right? So it has to do a non-linear separation, which is not possible by any of the machine learning algorithm. And that's where you have to have many, many layers of the, uh, you know, the basically neurons and many, many neurons in each layer 
to really make that complex um, uh, processing and the non-linear separation of the data. And typically speaking, I mean, uh, as a rule of thumb, you know, any deep learning application. So how can you separate a deep learning application from a machine learning application? If you're not able to run your algorithm within a reasonable point of time on your system, uh, it will be probably classified as a deep learning algorithm. So deep learning algorithms typically require the distributed computing, right? So more like the Hadoop, uh, you know, sort of uh, structure, or you can actually also look at the uh, GPUs as well, uh, graphic, pro graphic, graphical processing units as well. So it needs much more processing power to really come out with the same answers as compared to a machine learning model. Mano? Yeah, uh, so great. I think that, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Now we have some understanding of the difference between machine learning and deep learning. Now, uh, my question initially uh, was, and that's what uh, I'd want uh, you to talk about a bit, is that we are, talk, we, are, we are talking about deep learning, but we always understand deep learning in context of, say, Apple, Siri, or Amazon Alexa, or Google Home, yeah. and all. Yeah. Uh, if you can, you know, in the next 10 minutes, help us understand um, how deep learning is being used in fintech that will give us a very good perspective about um, what are the applications and how we can think because a lot of times what happens is that we are so focused on learning the technical skills yeah. that we yeah. forget that you know this thing eventually is for solving some problems so we forget yeah. about the business problems that we have to solve and we focus too much on uh, learning svm and learning logistic regression <laughs> and and that and that's something we've seen uh, students uh, and profession. I would, when I say students, uh, all be all are professionals mostly. Uh, uh, yeah. Make quite often. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I mean, uh, this is a good segue into uh, you know uh, our business case. I mean, this is not going to be guys. It's not going to be very full fledged uh, walk through of the entire case study. But hopefully, this uh, this is going to give you enough context to really see how we can really deploy this, uh, you know, deep learning in the business context, right? So I'll let you guys read it for a minute. And then I will ask you, can you tell me what this may really talk about in terms of the business situation? Why I have put this quote over here? Any guess is a good guess. Competition, Naveen says competition, okay. Competitive, uh, Conti says survival of the fittest, learning, always be ahead of your competition, survival of the fittest. Okay, close, very, very close, right? So the quote is that every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. Gazelle is nothing but a, you know, a deer sort of animal. It knows that it must outrun the fastest lion, a lion, or it will be killed, right? Every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up and it knows it, run, it has to be running faster than the slowest gazelle or it will starve, right? It doesn't matter whether you are lion or gazelle. The, so when the sun comes up, you have to be better running, right? So the, and, you know, the context over here is very, very simple and very, very uh, straightforward. And the application in the business world is that we are talking about fraud, right? And the fraud is nothing but the lion, right? And the victim is nothing but the gazelle. So when you or when a company is doing the business, they have to really know that they have to be faster than and smarter than the smartest fraudster out there. Otherwise, fraudsters will come and cheat them. Right. So the gazelle is nothing but a company and it happens to the individuals as well. But let's just uh, for the sake of simplicity, assume that a company is the gazelle and they have to be smarter than the smartest fraudster out there, otherwise, otherwise fraudsters are going to come and take benefit of the company, right? Now, on the other hand, the lion has to be just faster than the slowest gazelle. So they have to find those companies who are a little bit behind in their uh, preparedness to uh, preempt the fraud and the fraudulent activities, right? So they don't have to be the best in the industry. So they can actually just go and target those uh, companies which are actually slow to adopt the latest and the greatest in the technology and they will be killed. And I uh, haven't put the statistics or the numbers over here, but if you look at the fraud, I mean, it, the cost of the fraud for the banking and financial industry in the US is upwards of hundreds and billions of dollars, right? So it's that big an impact that it can create for any company. And if you're a small startup, 
and if you are a victim of fraud, so let's say I'm a small startup a fintech company, a lot of fintech companies are popping up even in India as you speak, right? You may have thousand good customers and you may uh, have made certain revenue from those customers. If you get 10 bad customers, 10 fraudulent cases, all your thousand customers worth of revenue is gonna be wiped off, right? So that is the power of the fraud. So unless it happens to you, you don't realize that. But the moment it happens to you, it can devastate you, right? Now the fraud just does not happen in the fintech industry. Uh, it happens everywhere. So can you guys tell me any examples of the frauds that you are aware of in your own personal experience, in your own industries? Okay, Enron, Vijay Malia, okay, good. Harshan, what is Harshan? Harshad Mehta, I guess, maybe, yeah. Customer service executives, credit cards, yep, cybercrime, phishing sites, uh, credit card fraud, Sahara. Okay, great, yeah. So it happens everywhere. So let's talk about some of the industries, right? So how it can happen. Uh, let's talk about the retail industry, for example. The one area where fraud happens in the retail industry is when somebody, uh, you know, comes and they, you know, will try to return the product. Uh, when they have actually misused the product, they may have, you know, cheated in terms of, you know, the actual usage of the product and so on and so forth. And they come and, you know, sort of like return that in the customer service. It's a huge cost. Any return for the retailers is, you know, a huge cost. Um, similarly, in the insurance industry, the fraud manifests in the forms of, you know, when you really haven't had any accidents or any of those necessities to claim the insurance, but you went ahead and claimed the insurance, they do investigation to really figure out whether that was a fraudulent claim or genuine claim, right? And in a lot of cases, they will reject the claims because they are so paranoid about the fraud, right? Uh, in the banking industry, obviously, I mean, we will be talking more about that, uh, but the fraud is that you take a loan from a bank or from a FinTech player, and you just never return that loan, right? So that's another fraud that happens. Uh, some of us, including me, have been the victims of the credit card fraud. And what really happens is that somebody uses your card for making transactions. So I, this is, you know, a couple of years back. Um, one of my cards, standard chartered cards. I mean, I uh, woke up in the morning and I saw that uh, I have a couple of uh, SMS alerts. And it says that your card has been swiped for $29.99 at Walgreens, right? And then there was another message like that, right? So immediately I called up the card company. I said, I mean, uh, who the heck is using my card because I'm sleeping in Bangalore and then this is coming out of, uh, you know, US. So there are a lot of uh, fraudulent transactions which happen and uh, believe it or not, I mean, we all are very, very susceptible for fraudulent activities, right? And the only way you can be ahead of the fraud game is that you have to be paranoid and you have to be thinking like a fraudster yourself. You have to be, you know, thinking with a hacker mindset and say what exactly is it that could be my weakest link and you have to make sure that you plug that weakest link, right? So that is what basically the business context over, it, over here is, right? Um, and I will, you know, this is a, you know, a quick view of the business case. So we will, uh, we have already talked about the FinTech cabbage. We'll talk about, you know, what are the key drivers of the fraud in the FinTech lending? What, what are the different uh, MOs, modus operandi, or basically the ways that they operate why there's need for deep learning and some sample application of the deep learning and then we will open up for the Q&A, right? So let's move forward. So what, yeah, Manu? Uh, no, yeah, so um, I think that was a good, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the line in Gazelle was a good uh, example and it happens, you know, across and that's why in fact, apart from, uh, apart from machine learning and AI, one of the areas that is which is evolving is that uh, people who understand this space and who understand say security in, in big data, yeah. that is also the space that is uh, evolving. That's absolutely. quite common. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. You're right on. Thank you, Manu. So guys, uh, why you're talking about the fraud in the fintech industry, right? So there are several things which are quite unique. So, uh, you know, the decisioning is done within a few minutes. So in Cabbage, 95% uh, of the loans are processed in X minutes or X hour. Can you tell me any guesses what could be X? 95% of the loans are processed in X minutes or X hours. What could be the X for X days? 
five minutes, right? So a lot of you guys are getting the correct answer. So that's exactly right. So within the time frame of five minutes from the start of your application to finishing of your application, 95% of the loans are processed within the five minutes. Now compare that to a bank application that you make in a typical bank like Bank of America or SDFC or even worse SBI. Right. So that's like several days worth of affair. I mean, it's like almost you're preparing for a marriage in the family. Right. So it's that much, uh, you know, difference that we have in terms of, you know, the execution speed. Now, what really happens with that, uh, you know, execution speed is that you really don't have that much time to react on the customer. You don't have really that much time to interrogate and investigate the customers and know all about the customer. So you have to be very, very quick. Right. The second thing is the invisible application. Most of the applications are made on the web and mobile devices, right? Almost all applications are made on the web and mobile devices. You have never physically seen the customer, right? The third reason for those of you who come in from the financial background, you will understand this term, but I mean, for those who are not, don't worry about that. We have higher exposure to the thin file and new to credit. Thin file is a customer who has not taken, you know, enough number of loans earlier and we do not have a view of how their payment history is, right? Similarly, new to credit is a customer who has never taken a loan. So for example, when I went to US to get my master's degree, I actually applied for a card and nobody was willing to give me a card because they said, you don't have any credit history. So you need to have a FICO score, similar to a FICO score, India has a civil score, right? So that is the new to credit. So some of the lenders give the loans to the new to credit customer as well. And that's why they have, you know, higher exposure. Uh, the other reason is invisible window that you can apply for multiple loans within a short period of time. And, you know, if you have applied for, lend, uh, for a loan with lender X, immediately you can go and apply for a loan with lender Y and then you can apply with lender Z. And I would have no clue whatsoever that you applied with Y and Z as well. And I'll be making a decision thinking that you only applied with me, right? And then finally, the unconventional and evolving data sources. I mean, uh, we use a lot of unique data sources and I will talk about some of them a little bit later, right? So that's, uh, you know, some of the key reasons why the fraud is actually more prevalent over here. And even with all the risk that we have, I mean, the fraud rate in the industry is less than 20 bits and cabbage is significantly below that. So we are doing a you know fantastic job in terms of preventing any fraudulent activity, right? So what are the different MOs? MOs are basically nothing but the modus operandi, how people really work and how they operate. Stacking is one of the main one. Stacking is basically nothing but you apply multiple loans in a very short period of time as i mentioned earlier so you stack uh, you know one loan on top of another on top of another and you apply within a within a very very short period of time and that way you actually you know uh, stuff like you know make full of a lot of lenders at the same time the other one is fake account right what is a fake account that is basically you acquire somebody else's profile in India, it's quite easy. So, if, I mean, I can find the PAN number of people, right? So if you have the PAN number and if you also have the Aadhaar number and if you have, you know, you know, some other information like the address and the date of birth and so on and so forth, I can go ahead and apply on behalf of Manu that I, I want to take a 5 lakh rupees worth of loan from ICICI Bank, right? And if I, you know, prove all the things and, you know, I can, you know, fake the accounts, I can go ahead and get the account. And these customers have no willingness to pay. So even with the stacking customers, they do not pay you back. So the moment they get the money from you, they will run away like, uh, like anything. So you cannot trace them and they have actually, uh, you know, uh, you have to write off that balance inside. Right? The last MO is really very, very interesting, which is the bust off. And these are the, you know, honest fraudsters. And, <laughs> and I will talk about, you know, why they are honest fraudsters. So what they do is basically they will come in they will provide all the correct information to you. So for example, I can go and apply uh, for a loan in Bank of America and I will say, yes, this is Atna Pandey, this is my date of birth, this is my social security number and so on and so forth. So Bank of America will give me a personal loan, let's say for 20,000 US dollars, right? I will start paying that loan back um, as per the, the payment terms. And over a period of time, I will build the credibility with the bank. And then, then I will go and approach them and I say, now I want a 50,000 US dollars loan. It's okay, fine. I will again pay that loan back. Then I will go and say, I want a 100,000 US dollar loan. They will again give me that loan because I have built some significant credit history with the, you know, with the lender. Now, when I see that my gains are the maximum, when I have the biggest value that I can derive, that is when I'm going to bust out and you really cannot trace me after that right so this is the third mo 
So now this is a good segue to you know why we need deep learning because of these different varied uh, MOs that we're looking at. And believe it or not, this is just you know scratching the surface in terms of the possible MOs uh, that we may have. Fraudsters can use many many more different ways of you know frauding the system. So that's why we have to really think about you know complex pattern recognition. So the patterns which are not possible for a human to recognize, how can we go and actually recognize those patterns, right? So what is the current situation? How do we do it? In most of the industries, we use either the intuitive rules, which are basically the manual rules, expert driven. So for example, if you have done this thing for last 15, 20 years, you know, just by looking at the case, whether somebody is a fraudster or somebody is genuine, you can tell based on the application, the gut feeling, something in your uh, gut tells you that this is correct or this is not correct. Right, or you can call it the sixth sense, whatever you want to call that. Right, the other one uh, that currently people use is heuristics, and heuristics is nothing but the rule of thumbs uh, for a certain case. So, if you know somebody comes in from a particular zip code, so for example, let's say I'm looking at Mumbai, right? So, if somebody applies from Dharavi, right, Dharavi you know, for those of you who don't know is a slum area in Mumbai. So, if I see an application coming in from Dharavi, my rule of thumb says. Uh, you know, uh, more or less, this guy is going to be a fraudster or high risk customer. I'm not going to apply that, right? So those are basically the rule of thumbs. The which is uh, the third one, which is a little bit more sophisticated, is the statistical. Where I mean, I have built the control and confidence limits, and I have you know some uh, outlier detection methods, right? So anything which deviates from a norm is going to be most likely a fraudulent cases. And that's where you see, you know, typically the industry has been using decision tree, regression, time series, and so on and so forth. So let me pause here, Mano. Uh, before I move on to the deep learning, anything you would like to add or comment on? No, since so the only thing is that I think the session is going great, but we are a little short on time. So if you can cover, now we have already understood that the way decision yeah. making goes, but if you can cover deep learning and why yeah. we need to get into this space very, very quickly in say another couple of minutes, uh, then we can Perfect. move to q and Perfect. Perfect. I'll do that. Yeah. So why go deep, right? So and we talked about this earlier. So a lot of unstructured data. So data which is not structured in the rows and columns or the tabular form format that we're all used to. I mean, that is not there. Uh, there's a lot of transactional data that comes in. Bureau data. Bureau, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's like, you know, the TransUnion, Experian, uh, Sybil, so on and so forth, right? There is tons of third parties data and there is a device and IP address data. So, you know, how long you have been on the site, which site you came in from, uh, are you on an iPhone versus Android, so on and so forth. There's a social data. What really it means is basically all of them really add collectively into massive amount of data. And that's what, you know, Mano was talking about earlier, that the amount of data has to be huge. So uh, very, very conservatively speaking, I mean, you could really be looking at, you know, 10,000 plus features. And features are nothing but the explanatory variables for whatever you're trying to explain, right? So this really becomes a great problem. So when you have these many features and some of these features could be video, some of these features could be audio, some could be text, some could be, you know, uh, transaction data and so on and so forth. How do you put them collectively in a box and then draw the insights from there? So that's where the deep learning really comes in, right? Uh, the, the beauty about the deep learning is that it can handle all of that and you don't have to do a very, very deep feature engineering. And, you know, for some of you who may have worked in the modeling uh, activities earlier, 80% of the time goes in doing the feature engineering and cleaning up your data, right? So you basically save a whole lot of time when you are going for the deep learning. You don't have to manually create the bins. You don't have to manually filter out the variables and so on and so forth and you will be directly able to use this data more or less in the raw format in the deep learning models, right? The other big benefit, and that was something that we talked earlier, is the real-time decisioning, right? So Kafka is, you know, the Apache tool that is coming in, and a lot of companies are adopting that. This is for the real streaming data. So as the real streaming data is coming in, how do we, how do we really take this data in and make the decisions in the real-time? MapR is basically another way of getting the streaming data, right? It also helps because everything is being done automated uh, in an automated way. You are creating a customer experience which is consistent. And because you're creating a, a unique customer experience which is consistent from customer to customer, so nobody can say you are discriminating against women versus men, black versus white, Asian versus non-Asians, and so on and so forth. That means you will be on the right side of the regulation most of the time, right? And because all of these things are being done in an automated way, you will also have the higher operational efficiency, right? So that's the background about that. 
So very quickly, uh, let's talk about some of the deep learning tools that we can use uh, for finding the anomalies. And don't worry if you don't get these names. So stack autoencoders and the DBN, deep belief networks or the replicator neural networks are used for finding the abnormal data from the normal data. Right? These are nothing but the neural networks and basically the input layer is same as the output layer and the output layer really tries to recreate the input layer and we get a, a metric called the reconstruction error, which is nothing but the mean square error. So wherever we find the error is higher, uh, those data points are flagged as the outliers. And uh, as we discussed earlier, the outliers are nothing but your uh, probable, uh, probable fraudulent cases that you're looking at, right? So this is one uh, quick way of you know, finding the anomalies of the outliers, but I will talk a little bit more about uh, the classification. And classification is nothing uh, but you know, putting things in different classes, right? So for example, uh, whether this person is a fraudulent or non-fraudulent, that's one classification, right? Whether this person is gonna default or non-default, that's another classification. Whether you will respond to the offer or will not respond to the offer, right? So all of those are classification. I mean, right now I'm just very simply talking about the binary classification. You can have many, many classes. So the next one that we're going to talk about is nothing but, um, so I'll skip that in the interest of time. So just uh, jump directly on the MLB. So in this case, I mean, this is the data from a real European bank. And these, uh, uh, this data has basically some fraudulent transactions. So around 0 0.7, 0 0.17% of the transactions are fraudulent, right? And uh, there are 30 features, 30 exploratory variables. There are total 284 observations that we have. And what we did in this exercise is to deploy a model called multi-layer multi -layer perceptron, which is nothing but a deep neural network to really build the network and try to see whether we can separate the fraudulent from the non-fraudulent, right? So this we did in Python um, and uh, Keras, which is nothing but a wrapper for the Python. Uh, and we used underlying engine, which is TensorFlow. This is an open source tool developed by Google for doing any sort of deep learning uh, application. And the good news, folks, is that you don't have to spend a single penny on any of these softwares. And even the professional companies, the consulting companies which are developing the solutions for their clients, most of them, they are using this. So that is the, you know, the biggest benefit in going with these platforms, that they are free. They are open source, you can find tons of good information. So what we did over here was basically leveraging the tools, we built a model, and the model uh, came, came out like this. Uh, so very, very accurate. Uh, so 99.9% .9 accurate in terms of the classification of the fraudulent versus the non-fraudulent. And I will just uh, bring your attention to this particular parameter, which is the recall score. Recall score is nothing but out of 100 fraudulent cases, how many fraudulent cases you were able to detect? So our model was successfully able to detect 75 fraudulent cases from the 100 possible fraudulent cases. The other side is the precision score, which is you know when you call somebody a fraudster, how likely is it that person is really a fraudster? So what, what is your true positive rate or what is your false positive error rate, right? So in this case, we are 77% confident that when we call somebody a fraudster, they will really be a fraudster, right? So these metrics are, as such, I mean, uh, relatively speaking, can be, uh, you know, something that we can work with. But uh, when you get in more advanced uh, area, I mean, you can really uh, do a lot of optimization of the hyperparameters of the neural network, and you can actually improve these scores further. I'm not going to go there because that is beyond the scope of the discussion today. But it just shows, you know, how quickly you can build a neural network or deep network in Python, Keras, and TensorFlow and come out with reasonably uh, good model that can be deployed in the production environment. So Manav, I will pause here. I think I have covered all the material. Yeah, great. Um, I think that gives us a good sense uh, now, especially with that slide in which you displayed uh, that more than 10,000 variables are required in a, a lot of times to make good decisions. And that's the first characteristic. Because when you are doing machine learning, you spend so much time on feature engineering that beyond yeah. a certain point, machine learning is not possible and you can't build yeah. a really robust model. And that's, that's, I think, you know, for me, that's my favorite part about deep learning that uh, you get to do a lot and work with a lot of things. And it's, it's like a black box, things go and over a period of time, you get better and better results. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
So now uh, let's move on to the now we have covered that uh, how deep learning is being used in different uh, industries apart from internet companies the big internet companies that we, we we talk about and i hope that participants would have gotten a good idea that what are the yeah. different ways and why you need to uh, uh, why deep learning is required in all industry not only in internet companies so ratakar now what we are going to do is we are going to quickly switch the gears and we are going to mm -hmm. move on to the career section uh, because that's okay. something a lot of people are interested in this and uh, just one. Uh, so I think uh, uh, it would be good if uh, Ratnagar can give a uh, quick overview of time required to kind of train the deep learning model because I think uh, so people should be aware of the trade-offs in the sense uh, versus a machine learning algorithm, how how complex yeah. deep learning is. Yeah. Aspect, and then we can switch to careers aspect. Sure, sure. So uh, this really depends on how complex the network is. So the network that I have built, I mean, uh, even with the optimization, and I actually did it on my Mac uh, with uh, 16 GB of RAM, so I didn't deploy any distributed system. So it took me about, you know, one hour, 30 minutes to get the uh, results out, right? But when you're really trying to develop the deep networks and the networks which will take you know, some time to really uh, learn and come out with the more accurate results, it could be days and weeks that we're looking at, right? So it really is you know, something, I mean, it depends on the scale of things that you're doing. You could have clearly seen that the data that I had was more like a very small data set, so I had 20, uh, 80K observations. But in reality, you'll have millions of transactions coming in in real time basis, right? So that would take days and weeks, uh, depending on the network that you're trying to build. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll let the uh, audience ask the question uh, that they have related to careers. But before that, Ratnakar, I have one question for you. You have 15 years of experience. You are heading mm -hmm. analytics at Cabbage. Mm -hmm. But still, you are so much hands on. And that's something that I find really interesting. <laughs> because in India, especially in the IT industry, the moment you have crossed 10 years, you become a people yeah. manager. You are essentially doing coordination work between the client and the people and suddenly yeah. you are kind of uh, your skill level in terms of where the world is moving suddenly drops from say uh, 8 on 10 to 4 on 10 right uh, so how do you manage that and uh, what excites you about this field yeah so uh, that's a great question i mean and i get asked this question a lot people get really surprised when i say i know python r and you know so on so forth right the thing that really keeps me motivated is uh, being hands on right so obviously i need to have it for you know being very um, you know uh, useful for my team number one number two is i mean the field of analytics and data science is evolving just like you know what it has been the case for the it industry information technology right so those who started their career way back, I mean, they would have learned Perl, C, C++, right? Now nobody is using that or very few people are using that. Now we have moved on to Java, Ruby on Rails and so on and so forth, right? So you have to really ensure that you are constantly on the frontier in terms of the latest and the greatest in the industry, right? And more important than that, I mean, I think if you are hands-on, I mean, you will really know what is the right solution for the right problem uh, that you have to really address, right? Because one of the mindset that the data analytics professional develop is uh, that if you have hammer, you will look for the nails. So just because I've learned the deep learning, I have to go and apply deep learning everywhere, right? So it doesn't have to be the case. So sometimes the simple linear regression will work just as efficiently as a deep learning network, right? So how do you really, you know, make sure that you're not you know, sort of like going with the hype and deploying the right tool for the right cases is what really amounts to you being very, very hands-on and knowing the exact solution, right? Your stakeholders, Manav, do not appreciate whether you're deploying a deep learning or some other network. They appreciate more the solution and the value you are able to create. Whether that value comes in from Excel or from the deep learning, that is something that you have to decide as the data analytics profession. Yeah? True. And um, regarding what I asked you that uh, regarding hands on a quick, um, um, you know, um, quote from my side, um, mm -hmm. there's a very famous saying that you would have heard that history repeats itself, right? But mm -hmm. what I say yeah. is that technology world history never repeats itself. You had the <laughs> IT uh, which was there, it came, yeah. it, it, it went. Then you had the yeah. mobile revolution which started in 2008, it came and the mobile wave uh, went. And right. now we have heard the wave which is coming, which is the machine learning and AI wave. And mm -hmm. uh, that's very important. That's why in technology world that whatever wave is com coming, you have to mm -hmm. stay in touch with that wave 
and that comes Absolutely. only when you understand that field really well and you are just not managing people because over a period of time people will realize that the people that my manager himself does not have any clue he, all he can do is he just can mm. speak uh, so catching that wave and riding that wave is very very uh, important absolutely 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 yep all right and, uh, and this is a this is a process man i mean so uh, what i suggest to you know people who come to me in terms of advice on quora or whatever other forums i say you know every week four to five hours you have to invest in your learning doesn't matter whether you are satisfied in your job or you're not satisfied in your job four to five hours every week you should be investing in order to make sure that you are at least being you know fully aware of the latest and the greatest in the industry yeah right now one question i have is uh, that there are a lot of participants here with the 10 plus 15 plus years of experience working or mm -hmm. as a project manager or uh, a, a tech architect or something in that capacity uh, mm -hmm. what's your advice to these people because uh, people with lower amount of experience say if you have five years of experience you can enter the industry say as a machine learning engineer or you know data analytics uh, at, mm -hmm. at a junior uh, yeah. But a lot of these people are, uh, you know, not sure how do they, first of all, once they learn, what will be the career paths uh, for them, number one. And number two is a lot of us, you know, always think that if I have to, if I've learned machine learning, depth, I need to become a machine learning a professional. While what we say is that this is a skill like the way you learn Excel yeah. in technology yeah. world. It is a skill you need to have in spite of whatever, whether you're a project manager or a test lead, whatever area you are in. So um, if you can give us some perspective uh, into this, especially people with 15, 10 or 20 years of experience who entered the IT industry long time back. And now yeah. they realize that the IT industry in itself is going through dramatic shifts and they have to upskill themselves. So if you can share uh, uh, some perspective. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I get this question a lot, uh, Manal. So my advice, uh, folks, is that, uh, I mean, don't imagine that this is going to be an overnight transformation. Like anything in life, I mean, it will take a lot of grit and a lot of passion and a lot of dedication and hard work from your side. But rest be assured that this can be something that you can do. I have seen, you know, umpteen number of cases. So, you know, whoever I have trained earlier in my career, I mean, some of these guys call me, you know, six months or nine months after they have finished the training and they will say, sir, thank you, I have gotten a job finally, right? So it's not going to be that easy that, I mean, you finish the training today and then tomorrow you will be, you know, fully uh, into a job. So you have to keep on, you know, having the mindset that, uh, yes, I will keep learning and I will keep doing the stuff. And uh, this is going to be, you know, something that I will practice on a daily basis, right? And there are plenty of forums and I can guide you offline in terms of how you can do that, right? So plenty of forums where you can make sure that you're practicing the skills that you're learning. But the other point I will say is that don't uh, you know, expect the 180 degree turn in your career. So let's say you're working in the IT industry. The more feasible way of doing that is that within your company, within the core competency that you have developed, how can you bake in more analytical thought process? How can you get more data science involved in there, right? Believe it or not, I mean, everybody is going to need the data science skills, right? So period. So whether you want to continue in your job, whether you want to look for a different job, whether you want to upgrade yourself or whatever the case may be, you have to know these things. These are becoming more like the hygiene factors, right? Uh, just like, you know, what had happened in the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of people who said, I don't know computers, right? Or I don't know Microsoft Office. Now you have to know it, otherwise you'll be a dinosaur. Nobody is gonna be looking at you and you'll be extinct, right? Same thing is gonna happen over here. And for you to make this transition faster, I mean, you have to first of all learn. Second, you have to invest time in doing that and third, find out the opportunities where you are leveraging your existing core competency and particularly with the guys who have higher years of experience, you have to build on your software coding skills, you have to build on whatever you're doing and add that, uh, add the layer of data science as a separator or as a differentiator from your peer group. And that's where you will find a lot of value coming in. Yeah. And you know, just to add to that, uh, in DataCon on 13th of May that we are having here, we are inviting uh, head of Google projects for IBM. And I was That's amazed great. to see uh, this uh, speaker has 20 years of experience and is so hands-on. He's managing a team, entire vertical of 140 people, and is so hands-on with TensorFlow, with all of yeah. the things. That I yeah. was like, how do you, you know, you, do you learn this thing? You know, he was saying that, 
if i first of all want to save my job and if i want to stay relevant for the next 10 years i have yeah. to i have no option right exactly exactly that's exactly right yep. yeah uh, okay next question um, is that um, what what is the uh, typical uh, typical now there are people who are working in say banking there are people mm -hmm. who are working in manufacturing there are people who are working in different industries within it right mm -hmm. so now the for these people the best thing that we what we suggest is that look at you know you are working with say AT&T as your client and look at how AT&T can use say machine learning and how can the process they can implement this so that first of all they know how to implement this instead of directly becoming a data scientist all right yep, yep, so you yep. do a proof of concept with the, a bank or any other firm in whatever space that you are in so what yep. are the uh, steps that you would recommend uh, to people that if I am, say, working with a client, say, Volkswagen or the British Telecom uh, mm -hmm. as a client and I'm working in Accenture, uh, mm -hmm. how should, and I now I have these skills of machine learning, analytics and all, what should be the starting point for me within my project? What should be I suggesting to the management? If they say, mm -hmm. obviously, all, all of them will say, just go ahead. But what should yeah. be the starting points uh, after that? That's a very, very important question. Uh, that I would want to ask. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Uh, that's a great question because a lot of people struggle with that uh, and how to implement and how to convince the management. And I will go back to you know how we actually uh, began our life. So first we have to uh, crawl, learn how to crawl, and then learn how to walk, and then we have to learn how to run. Right. Same thing happens in terms of the adoption of some of these tools and techniques in any company. Right. So you have to start small. You have to do those proof of concepts. You have to show some, you know, low hanging fruits and the wins that you are able to accomplish from there, right? So let's say, I mean, uh, historically, I'm just making up some example, right? So let's say historically the company has been doing some forecasting, but that forecasting was, you know, primarily driven by the gut feeling that I think this quarter is going to be this much sales and so on and so forth. If you come in there and you say, okay, I'm going to implement this forecasting and I will improve that by applying a moving average algorithm. In Excel, right? So that could be the starting point, or exponential smoothing algorithm in Excel, and you show that yes, my forecast is you know 30 uh, bips better than your actual uh, you know original forecast. Basically, the champion and challenger. So the champion will stay until you come out with the challenger offer and challenger technique and show that challenger is indeed better, right? So now you have gotten the buy-in on you know something that you are trying to sell. Once you have gotten that, then you can say, okay, now I can build a time series model, an ARIMA model, for example. And then you can say, I'm going to deploy that in R. And then I will come back and show you that even that performs better than whatever we have, right? So it has to be the step-by-step -step thing. So if you directly go to the last stage and expect that everybody is going to be convinced, that rarely happens. So you have to have some quick wins. And people do not have patience to really wait for you know several months and several quarters to really uh, see something coming out from there. So if you say I'm going to do something and I'm going to show something, it better be quick and it better be efficient. It better be you know more in terms of the language that they understand. So if you say my R square is this or my FL is this, they don't care about that. They don't care about that any of those things. You have to be talking in terms of the business numbers so I can change the revenue or I can improve the forecast. And improving the forecast will, you know, give us this much higher sales or this much better operational exp operational efficiencies and so on and so forth. So you have to talk the language that these guys really understand, right? And that's where, you know, a lot of the storytelling and the communication skills will come in very, very handy, right? Just because you are the data analytics professional, it doesn't mean that you have to always talk uh, in the weird language of the statistics. You have to break it down, whatever you're doing in plain English, and then use that plain English to talk to your stakeholders. Yeah. I absolutely love that answer because this is the question that we get asked so often. And this is the uh -huh. usual part, you know, that uh, uh, you have to take talk to management, not in terms of uh, the jargon, but in terms of the end goal that they are looking for. And exactly. that, that's that is very helpful to them. Okay, Kunal, you can pick one or two questions and then I'll ask a couple of questions more to Ratnakar. Yeah, I was just saying that, you know, given that a lot of audience had less than three years of experience with what we saw in the poll, if, you, uh, if Ratnakar, you can tell us what should be a good strategy for a fresher or someone with less experience to get into analytics and data science, I think that should help audience as well. There was a few questions I read on the same lines. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So less than three years in my experience is a sweet spot, Kunal. Uh, because uh, you can easily, uh, you know, flex your career. I mean, so whether you are doing sales or you're doing marketing or you are doing, you know, customer service or whatever you might be doing, I mean, you'll be much more uh, you know, likely to find a job if you have the right skill set and the right education, right? So first thing first, I'll suggest, I mean, that you have to, you know, upskill yourself. Uh, there are plenty of, you know, avenues that you can actually sign up with and, you know, Manav and Kunal will, you know, fill you in in terms of, you know, how we can do it, right? But there are plenty of avenues where you can actually start taking up the courses and, you know, start the journey. So if you have to reach to the destination, you have to take the first step. And the first step is that I will start that journey today, right? And uh, starting journey is not necessarily, uh, you know, equal to finishing the journey. I've seen a lot of people who will be super excited after the webinar. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And then, you know, one week down the road, I mean, they say, no, no, it's too much for me. I cannot handle it, right? So you have to really be, you know, persistent. You have to have the great, you know, that you're going to struggle. You're going to stumble. Sometimes you will feel like, you know, that I'm stupid. I don't understand anything. But just you have to overcome all of these challenges to really come on the other side. And believe it or not, it is possible. And the time is on your side. So I think sooner you start, better it is. Sure. And the, just to add to that, a quick comment, you know, the thing about this area is that it, it, you don't have to go to this area. This area in itself calls you because I was a, I was a, when, when I started this venture, I was pretty new to this. I did not have uh, to, you know, kind of go to someone and say that, uh, uh, what is this area about? Over a period of time, I started learning and learning and learning and learning more about this thing because there are so many things happening that today you say that, uh, we say that this has happened now in another one month, something else is happening. And, the, and, the traditional mindset in the IT industry, especially that we have had is that it's a static kind of mindset. So if we, and we get scared that, oh, this is a new technology. But if you're excited about what is happening, then it is like, if you, you'd say that, you know, my life is so exciting because I'm actually getting to learn a lot. Yeah, so those, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, another question, which is, uh, you know, again, come up multiple times in the Q&A uh, today is impact of uh, IoT, uh, I mean, in general and uh, anything specific you can share on FinTech uh, or some use cases, if you can kind of lay out, I think that, that should also kind of help out. Okay, sure, sure. So, uh, Internet of the Things, uh, folks, I mean, uh, very, very simply put, is nothing but the connected devices, right? And that, you know, everything communicates to each other and they pass on the message from one device to another device and so on and so forth. One very good example which I can give you is basically the uh, the digital replica, right? And uh, for those of you who are actually working in the manufacturing setup or the operational setup, and I will name one particular company, uh, which is the General Electrics, right? So they make engines, right? And they make the jet engines as well, right? So they fine tune a lot of different parameters in the jet engines to really save the fuel. And believe it or not, even uh, you know smallest change can make a significant difference in the fuel efficiency and the cost that it is there for running the jet plane, right? So what they do using the IoT of the thing is that the actual engine that they have, they will create a digital replica of that and they will sort of like do the simulation and they will have all the parameters that they're trying to control and the digital replica, which is basically nothing but the IoT, is going to mimic the exact performance of the jet engine and it will mimic the weather pattern, it will mimic the, you know, the load that the plane is carrying, the fuel it is carrying, the, you know, the headwind, the tailwind it is having and so on and so forth. And it will tell exactly what is it that they should be doing. And they communicate in the real time basis. So the digital replica is uh, talking to the actual physical instrument and it's basically optimizing the parameters in the real time basis. So that's why you see, I mean, that a lot of these machine learning, deep learning, can be used along with the IoT to really bring in a lot of operational efficiencies. Thanks. thanks. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks, Arun. Uh, I think there are uh, a few more questions on the career aspect, uh, and uh, so I think I'll just kind of take a common theme, which is you know how do you gain kind of more hands-on experience because that's that's kind of the uh, so so if you can share some. Uh, uh, ways in which people can get hands-on experience on either live data or open data or competitions and whatever uh, things uh, and how they can kind of upskill themselves to apply for some of these roles. I think that 
Yeah, yeah. So I think both of you guys also run a lot of uh, competitions and uh, you know the data challenges on your own, right? So I think that will be the good place to start in terms of you know the analytics with the and the Apex Academy. Uh, besides that, I will suggest, I mean, for those of you who are more uh, serious about building a career and have built certain level of competency, so don't jump on it right away. Uh, you have to build certain level of competency and then you can go on to platforms like Kaggle. And there are plenty of other platforms like that. I can, you know, tell you offline. Uh, you have to go there and, you know, you have to begin with the cases which are solved. Uh, so there is, you know, very, very popular case study uh, on Titanic, right? And it's like, you know, when you <laughs> begin your programming uh, journey, you say hello world as the first code that you type, right? So similarly, when you actually begin your modeling journey, you have to go and solve the Titanic case. And Titanic is nothing but the shipwreck that happened in the, you know, the 20th century where, you know, you know, hundred plus people, I mean, hundreds of people died actually. So the model tries to predict who is going to survive, who is going to uh, not survive based on the class they were traveling, based on the age, based on the gender based on the wealth and so on and so forth. So that's a very, very good, you know, case study to begin with. There are other case studies like IRIS. IRIS is, you know, very, very popular uh, data source where, I mean, we have the three varieties of the flower, you know, Setosa, Varsicolor, and, you know, some other, I'm forgetting the name of that, right? Uh, that also is used for a variety of different purposes. There is a German credit card data that is freely available for doing the classification, right? So the bottom line is, guys, that uh, the only thing that you need to have is the willingness and the desire to jump on it. You will never be, uh, you know, sort of like, you know, at the, uh, you will never be in a situation where you don't have enough data to work on. And all of these things are free uh, in terms of the data sources that I'm talking about. Plus, you know, the guided, um, you know, uh, tutoring and mentoring uh, with the Apex Academy and what Kunal is talking about will be, uh, you know, boost further, right? Yeah, one question, um, again, Ratnakar is uh, that we get very often is that, and you would see, you know, from the chat window is that, uh, there is, especially the way our education system is, we there is usually a very heavy focus on uh, the concepts, as in, you know, uh, which algorithm should I learn? Which algorithm should I be get me a, a job in this? Uh, what what yeah. should I be doing? While uh, that approach works for, say, when you are doing something like you're learning Java or C++, but here it is much beyond learning five different algorithms because essentially you have five different, uh, you were saying, you, you know, as you said, uh, the yeah, hammer and nail, nail example, you have five yeah. hammers and you don't, you are applying those five hammers everywhere, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, data science is much more about, much more than that. It is about communicating, uh, understanding problems and thinking in a structured way, much, much beyond, which is not exactly what uh, algor learning and algorithm is about. Exactly. 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 Linear regression from somewhere. So. It just give us some perspective related to that because this is something that all of us are very constrained by that I need to learn these algorithms and that means I've become a data scientist. Mm -hmm. Yep. See, it, uh, it really depends on the business problem you're trying to solve, right? And what exactly is it that uh, the mandate is for you, right? Um, so I'll give you some, you know, parallels. So for example, if you're working in the image recognition or voice recognition, sort of area, right? So for you to learn a uh, logistic regression is absolutely a waste of time, right? You should directly go and jump onto the uh, the, you know, the deep learning and machine learning because image recognition and voice recognition, there is no way, I mean, you can get a viable solution based on the traditional techniques, right? On the other hand, let's say if you're working in a typical banking setup, uh, like a city group or HSBC, where you are building the models which will be going through the regulation, like the OCC guidelines, or, or, you know, other regular fair lending act and so on and so forth. I mean, if you build a neural network there and take it to the, you know, the regulators, they don't understand your network. They will never approve your model, right? So whatever good you build, I mean, even if it is a very, very fancy solution, just because you will not be able to cross that hurdle in terms of the regulatory compliance and so on and so forth, that tool may not be uh, the right tool for you, right? So you're better off going with a logistic regression which everybody understands from the regulations part of you, right? So it really depends on the business case, but uh, as a data scientist, I mean, you really need to have all these tools in your kitty, in your palette, over a period of time, and you need to really figure out where is it that you should be deploying uh, what tool, right? As I mentioned earlier, uh, we should be parsimonious and we should be stingy, right? Unless you have to build a deep 
learning network, I mean, why do you want to waste the system resources and your time and effort and customer's time and effort in doing that unless you are finding some meaningful insight and uh, marginal utility coming out of that, right? So that would be my suggestion, Manu. Right, great. So a uh, last question from Kunal and then I'll ask a last question and then I think we'll wind up, Kunal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I was saying we are running out of time. Uh, uh, so uh, quick question, Ratnagar, any resources, books, co uh, courses which you can recommend to the audience? I think that's, that's I think, uh, a common thing. I think there's plenty of uh, free courses available on Coursera, Linda. I mean, if, uh, for those of you who are very, very self-driven, most of us, we are not. Most of us, I mean, we need more coaching, more, um, you know, hand-holding and stuff like that. So if you're very, very, you can actually go to these platforms and you can do it. But uh, I have also taken courses myself on Coursera and I have, uh, you know, uh, found out that some of those may not necessarily be very, very obvious for the freshers and the drop off rate there is you know upwards of 80 to 90 percent because you begin the journey but you're not able to figure out and you lose interest and then you actually uh, go haywire right so i mean those are the good places to start but i think i mean for those of you who are really serious about building your career in this i think i mean it's better that you have some instructor-led uh, courses where i mean if you're stuck you have you know some ways of getting your queries clarified um, if you have, you know, some questions or some applications from your uh, specific business areas, you can get more insight because, you know, sitting in a class and, you know, listening it as a lecture versus doing things on your own, those are two different things. So uh, you have to be looking at the, you know, the opportunities where you are doing things on your own rather than, you know, somebody else is doing and you are watching because watching is not going to cut it. Right. So last question from me, which is not related to machine learning, but to your mm -hmm. career journey, which is pretty interesting, is that I see that in your career journey, you have moved from big companies to over a period of time uh, startups. Uh, and, you know, that, that's been the same thing for us as well. So why the yeah. move from City Bank to a smaller company <laughs> and then to a smaller company? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, the big companies provide you, you know, a lot of, um, you know, comfort uh, in terms of your very well-defined scope of things, um, you know, and uh, very well-managed, you know, you know, time that you have to spend in office and so on and so forth. But the cost that you have to pay there is that the learnings may not be as much as you would be doing in a startup, right? And the upside may not be as much as what you have in the uh, startup environment as well, right? So uh, I've seen, you know, a number of cases where people have joined startup in early stage and they have equity in the company and they have actually put their, you know, sweat and time and stuff like that. And they have really gained big rewards, right? But besides that, I mean, forget about the equity. I think, I mean, the amount of learning that you will be doing in a startup and the amount of accountability that you're going to have in a startup is going to be many, many fold higher than what you have in a big setup, right? In a big setup, I mean, if I hired an analyst, let's say, I mean, we used to hire from IITs, right? And uh, those guys, when we would bring them in city group, they will typically be working on a reporting job, right? So I will tell them this is a report that you have to create, right? And uh, when I hire the analyst from, again, the same campuses, but I'm hiring for cabbage, these guys are building the machine learning models over here, right? So within, you know, the same experience, same pedigree, the exposure they are getting versus the exposure some of these guys are getting in the big companies will be significantly different. But uh, the downside there is that, I mean, there are obviously uncertainties in the job, right? And there's going to be a lot of last minute requests and there's going to be a lot of long hours that you have to be used to, right? <laughs> All right. I, I think that was, that, was, that was a good end to the session. Uh, thanks a bunch, uh, Ratnakar, for taking up the time to do this session. I know we have been after you for a long time to do this session. So thanks for agreeing to do that. And uh, uh, let us, all the participants, uh, let us just thank uh, Ratnakar for, for such a wonderful session. We covered a variety of topics. And uh, uh, Ratnakar, if you can leave your uh, LinkedIn and Quora profile here so that uh, you people can follow you. I'd highly, highly recommend all of you to follow Ratnakar on LinkedIn and Quora. He writes uh, great answers and I'm sure you'd benefit. And who knows, possibly this was, uh, this would be the starting point for your analytics journey, uh, just following Ratnakar on these uh, uh, platforms. 
Yeah, yep. 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 absolutely. Another, uh, I have also shared his uh, uh, Quora profile in the text window. Uh, I think that was a fabulous session. It's, it's kind of always inspiring to meet people who are still hands on after such a long uh, career in the <laughs> session. And, and I mean, that's, that's something that uh, is, is a very unique ability. So, so thanks a lot for sharing those insights with the community. I'm sure people would have uh, benefited. They, they would uh, reach out to you, I think, uh, uh, if they, if they uh, find so either through Quora or your LinkedIn profile. But absolutely, thanks a lot for that time. Uh, really for my session. session. Thanks, Mana. Thank friend. you, everyone. Have a great day. Great night. Talk Thank to you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks everyone. And tomorrow, just a quick announcement. Tomorrow we have the last session in machine learning week, which is a session with uh, uh, someone from Deloitte. And the topic is again, very interesting for those of you who are getting into this field from, from metallurgy to machine learning. Uh, Arko Bhattacharya is going to share his journey. And as we discussed, sometimes it's a long journey. It's been a very interesting journey over a period of four or five years. And uh, the session uh, is at uh, 11 a.m. tomorrow, so do attend the session. Thanks a lot, Ratnakar. Thank Thanks, you. Kunal, and th yeah, thank you, everyone, for attending the session. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Good morning for this session. Uh, so we uh, we were on Facebook Live. You can look at it there, or we'll also upload the recording on YouTube channels for both uh, uh, Apex Academy and Analytics Media, so you can follow it there as well. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.